Welcome everybody. Um, good afternoon and welcome to this week's um, Psychiatry Departmental Seminar. I'm really delighted to um, welcome Dr. Rashmi Patel. Um, he's going to talk about um, the strength of electronic records um, and some of you, you may or may not know I did my PhD and, and a couple of years of my interim fellowship at the Institute of Psychiatry and these records were just kicking off as I left and I can remember having conversations with Rob Stewart about if you were going to do really good child research what would you want so it's particularly interesting to see the fantastic stuff that they've been able to do so um, Dr. Rashmi Patel is an NIHR Advanced Fellow at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience, as it's now known. And he's also the Vice President for Medical and Scientific Affairs at Holmesk. Rashmi, over to you. Thank you very much, Tamsin. And it's a real pleasure uh, to be speaking to you today. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about electronic health record data and mental health and how this kind of data can actually uh, transform the way we approach uh, developing new treatments for mental disorders. Uh, so I have uh, a split role. I work uh, part time as a, a clinical research fellow uh, funded by the NIHR uh, at King's College London and also at Holmusk. Uh, mental health care technology, uh, generating real world evidence from electronic health record data uh, to support the development of uh, better treatments for mental health care. So I just thought I would begin, uh, before I get into discussing uh, electronic health records, uh, a little introduction to myself, uh, how I've got to where I am right here today, and maybe some of you will recognize uh, this photo, uh, this is a photo of first court of Christ's College, Cambridge, where I uh, started uh, my medical degree studying medical sciences and natural sciences, immunology and virology. Uh, before moving here, you, you, you may or may not recognize this photo. This is a photo of the chapel at Keble College in Oxford, uh, where I moved to complete my degree in clinical medicine. Uh, I then worked as a junior doctor in London and, and came back to Oxford to start training as a psychiatrist, as an academic clinical fellow, uh, before moving uh, in 2013 to King's College London, where I undertook an MRC uh, clinical research training fellowship uh, in electronic health record data analytics, particularly uh, developing natural language processing tools to extract clinically meaningful information from the free text of electronic health records. And much of my talk, I'll be describing uh, this approach. Um, so this is just an overview of what I'm going to talk about uh, this afternoon. And I'm going to give an overview of electronic health records, what they are, uh, how the data are structured, um, and how these kinds of data can support the generation of evidence uh, to better understand mental disorders and also develop uh, uh, better treatments. I will then describe uh, na about natural language processing, which is a, an automated method to extract clinically meaningful information from the free text of EHRs and some examples of uh, EHR data studies uh, using natural language processing and also the structured data in EHRs. Then the next part of the talk, um, I hope will generate some discussion around uh, the way we approach diagnostic classification and mental disorders, and why I think we really need to reform this to better uh, maximize the utility, not just of EHR data, but all types of data that we analyze in mental health research, including biomarker data, neuroimaging, uh, genetics, uh, and so forth. And then finally, how uh, data from EHRs could actually be fed back to clinicians and patients through data visualization tools to improve the care that people receive and increase access to treatments. Um, Everything I present, I'm going to be presenting today has been published either in a journal article or as a conference abstract, and you can access these on my website, um, uh, which is listed here. 
Uh, and I will go through quite quickly um, uh, uh, overviews of some of the examples. We may not have enough time to go through them in detail, but if there's anything uh, that's of particular interest that you hear about today, then please do feel free to contact me afterwards and I'm happy to have uh, uh, further discussions. So let's begin and start talking about uh, electronic health records. So um, all of you should be uh, familiar uh, or have had the experience of seeing a healthcare professional uh, either in general practice or in a specialist setting uh, and uh, you know what will happen is that you will have a clinical assessment. Um, the clinician will then document that information in an electronic health record, uh, and that serves as the anchor to coordinating the care that an individual receives. Um, so electronic health records include two types of data, structured data and unstructured data. And the structured data include information like demographics, um, diagnoses, medications. They can include structured data on symptom scores and rating scales. Um, and these sorts of data are relatively easy to assemble and analyze because they are either numerical or categorical. However, a lot of data are present in unstructured forms as free text. A clinician may write a series of sentences or paragraphs that describe the clinical history, uh, the events that have led up to the patient presenting to the healthcare service, and also the past history, uh, social history, personal history. These sorts of data represent a very rich source of information uh, that can be used for clinical research but are difficult to extract through manual review simply because of the volume. If you were to try to do this at scale, it would take a very long time for someone to sit down and extract these data. And I'm going to talk about natural language processing and methods that can be used to automate this process and assemble very large data sets of quite detailed clinical information for analysis. So, the real strength of EHR data uh, is the fact that um, it can be collected and stored centrally and then can be de-identified and um, entered into research register for, for, for secondary data analysis. And that's exactly what has happened in South London, in the South London and Maudsley NHS Trust, uh, which is a large provider of secondary mental health care with a catchment population of around 1.2 million people. And you can see here the map, uh, which is the four boroughs of South London, uh, this, the um, NHS Trust covers, uh, with um, almost 40,000 active patients per week. And the EHR data um, from our uh, EHR uh, system called EPJS, the Electronic Patient Record um, System, has been de-identified and assembled into a database um, with over 450,000 patients' data going back to 2007. And of course, the, the, the real benefit of this is that it's prospective. Every time a patient is seen, uh, data are documented, and these are updated, uh, de-identified and updated um, every 24 hours and every week. There's a pipeline that, that moves it into the de-identified data set. There are also data linkages with other data sets, for example, UK hospital um, statistics and mortality data sets that allow us to uh, obtain data uh, from other sources at individual patient level. The data are extracted using a tool called the Clinical Record Interactive Search Tool, or CRIS, and I will describe that in a moment. Um, and these data have contributed to uh, over 180 publications uh, in, in, in all sorts of areas of mental health care. So this diagram summarizes the architecture of the CRIS tool and the data resource. And um, the way it works is that the, the block in red represents the live EHR uh, data that the clinicians are interacting with every time they see patients. And then there's a processing pipeline uh, that's automated and de-identifies the, the data um, the process for this has been published if you're interested. Um, and then a user of the de-identified data set who could be a, uh, a, a researcher working within the NHS Trust or uh, the University uh, King's College London can then access these data either through a front-end uh, web-based search system, a bit like a Google search called the CRISPAS system, 
or through the back end through database queries on uh, Microsoft structured query language or SQL um, uh, management uh, studio. And I'll, I'll, I'll provide some examples of this. So what are the real strengths of using these kinds of data? Well, principally it's the large sample size. When you have got hundreds of thousands of patients data, you can start looking at subgroups and still maintain a uh, very good statistical power um, or multiple comparisons between different uh, um, interventions. Uh, and these sorts of questions are simply not feasible to address in randomized controlled trials, um, trying to look at more than you know, two or three different arms, you uh, get into problems in terms of statistical power and the number of people you have to recruit. The other major benefit is that they represent real world clinical practice um, that's representative of routine mental health care uh, and a long duration of follow up. Um, uh, you know, almost 10 years for a uh, large number of patients. So you can address questions which would other otherwise be very difficult to do with um, standard uh, RCT uh, approaches. So how do you go about extracting and analyzing the data? Um, as I mentioned previously, the data can be, can be broken down either into structured fields or unstructured fields. And the structured fields um, are, are relatively easy. I say relatively because there are still complexities in uh, coding the data, but relatively easy to assemble and uh, analyze. But the problem is only around 10% of the data are represented in structured fields. The way that clinicians interact with the HR and mental health care is largely in unstructured data, um, documents that are uh, created that uh, describe the clinical presentation the treatment plan, uh, letters to other healthcare professionals like GPs, um, and then follow up documents which uh, um, will describe the response to treatment. Um, and it's very difficult to extract these data manually because of the volume of data. And you can't simply undertake a free text search uh, on keywords to uh, provide you with information because mental health care data are complex. Um, even a human reading uh, an electronic health record note may have to think a little bit about the meaning and the context of the information. Um, so how can you address this challenge to actually get hold of data from this unstructured text? Um, that's where natural language processing comes in. And this is a text mining method that allows you to automatically extract information from free text documents. And um, this is not a, a new approach. This has been uh, in use for several decades, originally in areas such as media um, or finance. Uh, and now we are beginning to apply this approach to electronic health records to extract data on things like diagnoses, medications, and symptoms. Um, and this can enable a pretty rapid assembly of uh, rich clinical data from unstructured text. There are two uh, main approaches you can take. One is a rules-based approach and the other is a machine learning approach, or you can use a mixture of the two. In this slide uh, is uh, an example of a rules-based NLP tool developed by uh, the informatics group at the University of Sheffield using the general architecture for text engineering framework or GATE. Um, and this is a tool which is designed to be used on obstetric records to pull out clinically meaningful information uh, uh, that's relevant to this type of data. So for example, here you can see in uh, purple, uh, three centimeters, six centimeters, that tells you the cervical dilatation. Uh, cyan is systolic blood pressure, and then the, the darker uh, red is uh, diastolic. Then we have uh, proteinuria, uh, membrane status uh, in green there intact. And these features are being uh, pulled out through a series of rules. So for example, if you see the string BP colon, you then look for a number slash number, and that tells you the blood pressure. Um, this approach is, is 
uh, helpful if you're mainly pulling out uh, quite uh, well structured information, for example, numerical data or a very limited set of vocabulary for categorical data. But mental health care data tend to be more complex. There are very many different types of words and phrases you can use to describe uh, symptoms and mental state. And machine learning approaches allow you to more rapidly develop um, uh, more complex and exhaustive NLP algorithms um, to extract uh, more nuanced clinical features. Um, and one method uh, to do this is support vector machines. Um, and the approach uh, which is used is to first define the keywords of interest to a particular construct. So it could be that you're interested in uh, blunted affect, uh, poor motivation, social withdrawal, problems with eye contact. So you'd create a dictionary of terms, also known as a gazetteer, uh, of keywords that you can pull out information uh, relevant, and then a human annotator uh, with domain expertise, so a clinician ideally in the first instance can go through uh, some of these examples and um, record whether or not they are relevant for the for, uh, presence of the symptom or absence. Uh, so here, eye contact was poor versus makes good eye contact. Once you've done that, you then have a reference data set and a training data set that can be used to apply a uh, machine learning approach um, to automatically extract these clinical features in unseen data. And um, the way this works, broadly speaking, is that uh, the machine, first of all, separates the documents out into individual sentences. Then within the sentences, um, the individual words are broken down into what's called tokens, and tokens could be words or spaces or punctuation. Uh, those words are then tagged um, according to the keywords of interest, and then um, examples which are positive are analyzed to look at the clustering of words around the keywords um, to develop an automated algorithm to, to pull out the information automatically. That, that's just a sort of general overview. Uh, there are very many different um, algorithmic approaches, which um, I won't go into in this, in this uh, presentation, but um, uh, I'm happy to discuss later on. And uh, this is an example of the Text Hunter graphical user interface developed um, uh, by Richard Jackson, who I worked with. Um, at KCL, uh, and at this uh, particular example for an application for mood instability, and here we have the example, uh, a mood label continues to present with occasional tearfulness and express being low in mood during the shift. So we see the word mood is here and the modifier label, which tells us that this individual has documentation of mood instability. And so in this example, I came up uh, by reviewing the raw text with a dictionary of words which could indicate instability of mood, uh, for example, labor, dysregulation, changes, and so forth. And we looked at all, uh, um, pulled out all of the sentences, um, labeled, uh, you know, about a thousand or so, and that was the basis of the training data. You can then use uh, structured query language to uh, join the data from the output of the natural language processing. Uh, to patient level data. So, so this is an example of a SQL script. Um, and it, it looks, um, you know, a little bit complex, but actually uh, SQL, it kind of reads almost like English. Uh, so the first line tells you what data to use. The second line tells you what variables you want to select. Um, and then you can uh, compute new variables. Uh, so uh, the case when statement is um, the NLP data where a few um, parameters based around the NLP model have been entered to uh, provide a variable of zero or one if an individual has got documentation of cannabis use um, around the first month from when they first presented to mental health care services. So that's an overview of the uh, methods. I now want to describe uh, the application of EHR data and how this approach uh, can uh, both generate new evidence and also uh, support the development of new treatments. I will go through these examples relatively rapidly because I thought it'd be better to give you a broad overview of the different um, uh, use cases, um, but there'll be some time afterwards if you have some questions on the specific examples. Um, so I'll start off 
by uh, talking about some examples of EHR data to better understand how clinical factors are associated with outcomes. And three examples, um, looking at symptoms, uh, uh, and negative symptoms of schizophrenia, um, illicit substance use, um, and also just general sociodemographics. Um, so one of the first projects I worked on in collaboration with the Biomedical Research Center uh, team at the Wardsley Hospital uh, uh, with um, Professor Rob Stewart's group was to analyze some data on negative symptoms in schizophrenia. And we developed um, natural language processing tools to identify 10 different negative symptoms uh, documented in the text of people with schizophrenia uh, there on the left there. Um, and the rationale for doing this is that negative symptoms are um, a very uh, important and disabling feature of schizophrenia. And actually around half of people with schizophrenia have at least one negative symptom. Things like poor motivation, emotional withdrawal, social withdrawal um, can actually be very problematic. And these symptoms are difficult to treat. Um, pharmaceutical companies are uh, investigating new approaches to try to address these sorts of symptoms. Um, so in this study, we were able to apply these tools to over 7,600 patients with schizophrenia. So at the time, this was the largest study of negative symptoms in schizophrenia. Um, to manually obtain these data would have taken maybe um, one person, I don't know, several years to go through all of the text. Um, and you can see on the right here, the graph which shows that the more negative symptoms people had documented in their record, the longer they spent in hospital. So, um, you know, no negative symptoms associated with only around 30 days um, of, of, of an admission to going up to over 50 uh, for people who had six or more. This um, second example is a natural language processing tool to obtain data on cannabis exposure in first episode psychosis. And we know that cannabis is associated with increased risk of uh, developing a psychotic disorder, but we know less about its impact on people with a, a, an existing psychotic disorder. And um, I developed uh, a tool to extract cannabis exposure in people presenting to early intervention services. The sample size here is around 2000 patients. So again, uh, the largest study at the time that had been published looking at cannabis use in first episode psychosis. Blue in these charts is history of cannabis use and red is no history of cannabis use. And you can see here a clear separation in the outcomes of uh, number of days spent in hospital on the bottom left um, the uh, percentage admitted um, under the Mental Health Act in the top right, and then the number of hospital admissions in the bottom right going up to five years. Um, and uh, particular, uh, um, uh, you know, impact, but if you think about 35 extra days spent in hospital, that, that is a major impact on an individual and also uh, the healthcare service and, and society as a whole. Finally, um, in this section, uh, this is some work uh, led by a uh, um, research assistant working with me, Jessica Irving, looking at gender differences in clinical presentation in first episode psychosis. I think this is tremendously important because gender differences in healthcare are, are really under research, not just in psychiatry, but in all areas of healthcare. And um, we have the same approach to treatment um, despite the fact that the clinical presentation and probably also response to treatment varies. And we can see that here um, on the left side of this plot um, uh, indicates that the symptoms are more frequently occurring in females and the right side more frequently occurring in males. And you can see here for each of these symptom domains, uh, negative symptoms, positive symptoms going down to depressive symptoms. There are clear gender differences in clinical presentation. And I think our recognition of this um, could help us provide more tailored treatments um, that uh, are, are more personalized and address uh, pro problems rather than um, a, a sort of uh, one size fits all where we have a single treatment for a whole indication. I now want to talk about how EHR data can contribute to uh, healthcare services research. 
Um, and three examples here. The first is community treatment orders. Uh, and then the second weekend psychiatric hospital admission. And then the third, which I think is particularly pertinent uh, in light of the pandemic, remote mental health care. Um, so the first example, community treatment orders. And so CTOs are um, a form of legislation as part of the UK Mental Health Act that provide a framework for uh, compulsory uh, treatment uh, of mental health care disorders for patients in the community. And they can specify uh, things like what treatments an individual um, ha has been provided with. They could be medical treatments. It could also be um, uh, mental health care um, services and, and uh, uh, you know, engagement with mental health care services. And if um, someone is not engaging uh, with treatment, then they can be brought back into hospital, uh, recalled and the section revoked. Um, and these community treatment orders are controversial. And um, many of you may know about the um, OCTET study in Oxford, which demonstrated no difference uh, in the outcomes of people who were on CTOs and who were not on CTOs. And so I wanted to look at this in our electronic health record data. And we found actually that people on CTOs had uh, much higher rates of hospital admission than those not on CTOs. The whole point of CTOs was to try and keep people out of hospital. But this simply indicates the fact that it's almost like a sort of confounding by indication. People who are put on community treatment orders are the most unwell uh, patients and they are more likely to require hospital treatment. Um, and uh, in light of this, uh, the, the, this sort of um, evidence is very helpful when thinking about healthcare policy making and how we can better frame the way um, policy and our laws uh, uh, um, are framed around the healthcare that we provide. The second example came about uh, because of, um, uh, you may remember a time uh, there was a question about the NHS providing the same degree of care on a Saturday and Sunday in bank holiday as during the week, because it was recognized that mortality rates in acute general hospital were higher at the weekend than during the week. And so we wanted to see if this was the case in psychiatric hospitals as well. And interestingly, it's not. In fact, it's the exact opposite. If you're admitted to a psychiatric hospital at the weekend, your mortality risk is lower than if you're admitted during the week. The amount of time you spend in hospital is less, but you have an increased risk of uh, readmission. Um, this probably represents the fact that the cohort of people admitted at the weekend are different to the people admitted during the week um, and may represent people who have more unplanned admissions that are in response to psychosocial stresses, lack of community support, uh, illicit substance use or alcohol. Um, and uh, the other thing to remember is that even compulsory admissions under the Mental Health Act um, are, 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 you know, um, they can be planned. They're planned admissions that happen with a planned assessment uh, that can happen during the week. And that's slightly different to the emergency admissions uh, that may happen more at the weekend. Interestingly, we also found a Wednesday effect. Um, fewer discharges happening on Wednesdays than the rest of the, the week. Um, and uh, that coincides with the uh, uh, training program for uh, the junior doctors and medical staff. Uh, this was an interesting finding. Um, I didn't actually comment on it in the paper. I thought it may have been a little bit controversial, but uh, there we go. Um, and finally, remote mental health care, uh, which really uh, has been transformational as a result of the pandemic, um, we have had a rapid and unplanned shift to remote appointments. And uh, the impact of this shift is largely unknown because it was unplanned. And the degree to which we can ensure that remote mental health care um, is uh, of benefit to patients and that people have access to it is tremendously important because even as the pandemic subsides and COVID-19 becomes endemic, um, remote care is not, is not going away and actually has the potential to really improve access to care. But at the same time, we have to make sure that the people who, who would benefit from and require in-person care still 
still have access to this. Um, as the pandemic started um, around April uh, 2020, we were all thinking about how we can try and um, assemble data that can help uh, better inform the response. Uh, and I had the idea of uh, obtaining data on um, patterns of remote mental health care. And this is a summary of that. Uh, in the blue line, this is the number of clinical events in person. The uh, orange line is the number with remote, and then the green line is the number of unattended appointments. And this chart begins January 2019. And you can see after January 2020, rapid uptake and increase of remote appointments and a complete reversal with a drop in in-person appointments. You can also see a very interesting downward spike around December, January, which is, of course, Christmas and the new year. Um, and that's quite a useful benchmark to compare the, the change in clinical activity that, that happened uh, during the pandemic. What is even more interesting is the age distribution difference. And so this graph on the left is under 18 year olds, the middle is working age adults, and on the right is older adults. And you can see that the shift to remote care is very much more marked in children and adolescents compared to the elderly. Um, and this I think is very important because we need to think about why this is and to make sure that um, uh, older adults still have access to the care that they need um, and uh, uh, that uh, there's potentially a problem with digital exclusion. Um, and we need to think about how we can optimize these approaches uh, to ensure access to care. The other interesting thing is the rise of video appointments and the impact that this will have. We have been doing remote care uh, well before the pandemic. Uh, telephone appointments were um, uh, in, in widespread use, but just at a lower level. But you can see here practically no video calls until after the onset of the pandemic and now around a third of remote appointments are video calls. So if we can understand um, the pattern of these and uh, uh, what kinds of uh, clinical care may be um, uh, best conducted over video compared to phone call compared to in person, potentially we could transform access to care and uh, increase the availability of mental health care to a wider population. Um, and uh, finally, a, a bit about uh, using EHR data to look at treatment outcomes. The first example for antipsychotics and the second um, looking at antidepressants uh, and onset of mania in people with unipolar depression. So this is an example of a study. I looked at uh, long-acting injectable antipsychotics. So these are um, injections given uh, on anything between a, a two-weekly uh, to typically monthly, some now even three-monthly or six-monthly basis um, that mean a uh, patient no longer has to take uh, tablets or capsules every day. Um, they can just have an injection periodically. Um, and I wanted to try and understand differences in uh, clinical outcomes based on exposure to different long acting injectables. And you can see here six different um, treatments. Uh, I won't go into the details of, of each sort of different one, but suffice to say, um, doing this kind of study in an RCT is frankly impossible. You would never be able to randomize people to six different uh, long acting injectables. So real world data are the only way to um, assess this. Uh, and uh, um, uh, th this is uh, uh, um, a very important approach to see the real world impacts of, of treatments. Um, and uh, I've just got a question here, which I'll have a look at now. Uh, adjusted for all variables. Yeah, okay. So this is a, an interesting question looking at um, uh, 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 the, the, the gender differences. Um, and the question is, uh, um, this data has all the adjustment variables that we would like, or are there some that are lacking? And how could we adjust for these? So absolutely, electronic health record data only represent the data from clinical care. Um, you only have data that are um, uh, documented. You don't know anything that hasn't been documented, and it's only present um, during periods of clinical contact. 
a lot of the outcomes in mental health care are driven by social factors. And I think the way to um, have more data on this is from patient reporting outcome measures from, for example, digital tools on smartphones, which could complement the electronic health record. And I'll talk about that briefly actually later in this presentation. So thank you for that question. Um, the second example here, uh, looking at antidepressants in uh, um, unipolar depression and association with onset of mania, we know that in certain individuals, antidepressant therapy can actually um, uh, be associated with symptoms of mania, uh, perhaps even um, be associated with an episode of hypomania or mania. Uh, and so I looked at different antidepressants. This is an example looking at venlafaxine and the clear separation here with the rate of onset of a bipolar disorder diagnosis. But I should stress the axes on the left here. The clinical um, and actual absolute difference here is very minimal. Um, and so uh, it's important to bear in mind that uh, th this is one of the, the important things when you're looking at, at these sorts of data sets because the sample size is very large you can detect statistically significant differences that are small. Um, and it's important to be aware of this when interpreting the findings. Um, finally, just to touch on how EHR data could support new treatment development in the pharmaceutical pipeline. Um, and uh, I think there is a tremendous opportunity for these real world data sets to provide complementary evidence to randomized controlled trial data um, on areas that, that simply can't be addressed by RCTs and also address the difficulty of generalizability. Many RCTs have um, quite a lot of exclusion criteria, uh, for example, no co comorbid substance use or other comorbid mental disorders that are not reflective of real world clinical practice. And so real world evidence can be a very helpful complementary source of information to um, accompany randomized controlled trial data. Um, they can also help provide follow-up data after an RCT, uh, uh, also contribute to pharmacovigilance um, and inform future clinical trial design. If, you're if you are testing um, a new treatment and you want to think, could this be of benefit in other patient groups in other diagnoses? Um, and uh, potentially also uh, the use of external control arms uh, in order to provide a comparator without having to recruit patients to receive a placebo, which is both kind of ethically problematic um, if there is a, a treatment that has already had some evidence of benefit, uh, and it also is, is, is um, uh, you know, very resource intensive. And I think the last point is really uh, where I see this, the vision to use these data in real time for clinical decision support to identify people who could most benefit from uh, these types of treatments. So in the remainder of this talk, um, I just want to touch on the challenges of using real world data and quite frankly about all, all research in mental health care and psychiatry. And this really boils down to diagnostic classification. We have um, difficulties with the current framework of diagnostic classification in terms of their meaningfulness, uh, validity and reproducibility, because the classification uh, systems we have in place, the ICD and DSM do not represent the underlying etiology and pathophysiology of the disorders. And um, clinicians don't necessarily agree on them. Uh, so here's some data where I looked at the diagnostic trajectory of people with first episode psychosis. And we can see um, each one of these blocks represents a change in diagnostic category over time. Uh, patients beginning with a schizophreniform diagnosis, but then over time, there are increases in the share of um, other diagnoses, other psychotic disorders and bipolar disorder. And this reflects the diagnostic uncertainty in um, mental health care. This is a slide I include in nearly all my presentations from the DSM-5 field trials, um, which illustrate the inter-rater reliability of the DSM-5 disorders. And you can see at the top here, good agreement for disorders like major cognitive and neurocognitive disorder and PTSD. But as you go down the list, um, the agreement becomes questionable and you get to major depressive disorder the most prevalent um, and most frequently diagnosed disorder, uh, and we find rather questionable agreement. 
And what does this tell us about the way we analyze data around uh, individuals who have a major depressive disorder diagnosis? How can we interpret it? These are some data from uh, uh, a colleague of mine, Tony James, a child and adolescent psychiatrist in Oxford, who analyzed a diagnosis rates of bipolar disorder by age in different countries. The top line is the US, it goes down um, Australia, New Zealand, and then England and Germany. And you can see here, vastly increased rates of bipolar disorder diagnoses in children and adolescents in the US compared to Europe. Now, I can't think of a uh, biological or epidemiological reason for this. Um, this indicates a difference in the way the clinical categories and, and are used in the US compared to Europe. So what does this tell us about the meaningfulness of these diagnostic categories when we're using them um, for, for uh, diagnostic classification? Schizophrenia is another um, tricky area, uh, tricky diagnosis, very heterogeneous, um, and the question of what it represents is very tricky, um, but fear not, because uh, Jim Van Os has already tackled this question in a very interesting um, opinion piece in the BMJ uh, titled Schizophrenia Does Not Exist, um, that uh, this is a construct which uh, uh, is heterogeneous uh, and the label uh, actually may not be that meaningful at individual patient level. Um, this is not just a problem in psychiatry. This affects the whole of medicine, hypertension. Um, I mean, you know, we take a cutoff point for systolic and diastolic blood pressure to define the disorder of hypertension. That may not reflect the underlying etiology or pathophysiology. Um, so diabetes is a very interesting area. Um, and, you know, those of you who are um, uh, involved in, in clinical care and maybe we struggle with uh, how do we decide someone has type 1 or type 2 bipolar disorder will spare a thought for the endocrinologists who um, are, are still grappling with the concept of type 1 and type 2 diabetes simply because two constructs is not enough. Uh, it's, a, it, it, it's more complex than that. Um, and COVID-19. Uh, uh, the same etiology, the SARS-2 virus, but the actual clinical manifestation of COVID-19 is more than one disease. And we're still trying to understand the different types of disease, um, their uh, clinical and epidemiological correlates. Um, and so we really need to come up with better approaches to classification of uh, um, healthcare disorders. Uh, and this was outlined in an opinion piece by um, Ismail Kola and John Bell, that if we want to have any hope of understanding the underlying biology, we need to rethink how we can um, uh, frame the classification. Um, and this is an interesting quote from uh, Tom Insel, uh, published actually in Wired magazine uh, when he had finished his term as the director of the NIMH. Um, I succeeded in getting uh, lots of really cool papers published by cool scientists at fairly large costs, I think $20 billion. I don't think we moved the needle in reducing suicide, reducing hospitalizations or improving recovery. Um, and uh, uh, as a result of this, the RDOC framework was formed as, as an approach to try and um, uh, address this. Um, so how could real world uh, data from EHRs support uh, uh, maybe a more transdiagnostic approach to disorder classification? Um, well, the use of NLP derived measures, as I described before, could provide a more nuanced description of uh, pathophysiology, uh, oh, sorry, of, of, of phenomenology, which could better help us better understand pathophysiology and will be relevant to treatment developments. Now, a lot of no novel therapeutics target specific symptom domains rather than the entire disorders. And coming back to the previous question about how we get more data, the EHR data could be combined with brief rating scales that uh, patients and carers could complete remotely. And this could complement the data from healthcare services in RCTs and try and bridge the gap between the data collected in RCTs and uh, in um, other uh, uh, types of, of real world data. Um, and I'll just give an example of this. Uh, this is an example of a network analysis of symptoms of people who have a diagnosis of unipolar depression 
but including symptoms of mania here. Uh, so uh, orange is symptoms of depression, blue is symptoms of mania, and uh, green are symptoms which could overlap um, those of depression and mania. And we can see here um, how these symptoms uh, are clustered together in a network analysis and tell us that actually unipolar depression is a heterogeneous construct and some individuals with this diagnosis who fit this diagnosis may actually have features of mania and that could tell us they may have a different response to treatment and maybe a, a different approach to providing care to these individuals could improve clinical outcomes. Um, and finally, uh, just to talk about how EHR data could be fed back to patients and clinicians through data visualization tools that could inform the clinical care and provide more personalized care. And I see a future where a combination of patient reported outcome measures are integrated with EHR data, um, including NLP tools to draw data from the free text to provide, um, not, not to tell clinicians what the answer is or what treatment um, should be given or, or prescribed, but rather to personalize the assessment process and um, suggest options for treatment to reduce delays in uh, care, um, increase access to psychological therapies um, and to second line treatments. Um, this is an example of a tool uh, that is already in use in several NHS mental health trusts that is powered by an algorithm to predict risk of crisis based on data that's recorded in the EHR, uh, various complexity factors, for example, um, the presence of uh, substance use disorder diagnoses, previous mental health act admissions, being on a community treatment order. And this provides a risk rating for an individual uh, which is then fed back to clinicians in a clinical dashboard. You see an example of this on the bottom right. And this allows clinicians then to prioritize the care they provide to ensure that people don't slip through the net and that people who are at high risk of crisis have more intensive care. And conversely, people who are at low risk um, could be discharged back to primary care um, and therefore freeing up resources for new patients coming into the service. Um, so I will end there uh, and just uh, to summarize that some of the things I've talked about, EHR data supporting um, uh, evidence generation to better understand uh, mental disorders and move towards uh, better treatments, and how I think we need to think about the classification of mental disorders and the way we approach treatment development and delivery um, to a more nuanced approach uh, uh, that will hopefully be more um, relevant uh, and successful, uh, and how we can feed these data back in real time to clinicians and patients uh, to support the care that's being provided. Um, so I'll just end there uh, and thank uh, all of my funders uh, and the people I've been working with at KCL and in SLAM and further um, information is available on my website.